Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to episode 27 of the Afghan Eye podcast. My name is Sangar Paikar. And in this episode, our guest is Professor Ashok Swain, who uh, is a uh, professor at uh, Uppsala University at the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies. Uh, professor, welcome to the Afghan Eye podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Sangar. Uh, sir, uh, as you are well aware that uh, in, the in the last couple of weeks, Afghanistan is dominating the headlines. Um, there are new stories about different developments in Afghanistan. But in order to make sense of what is going on in Afghanistan, I would like to hear your opinion uh, and uh, your expertise as an observer. Uh, to be more specific, um, uh, Afghanistan has been in conflict for the last 43 years. And in the last 43 years, uh, we've seen different regime changes. Uh, um, and now, after 43 years, after the withdrawal or sort of practically almost withdrawal of all foreign forces, in the last two weeks, there is some tranquility in Afghanistan. Uh, now, there is a question whether we can call that peace. Uh, I would leave that to you. But at the same time, there are also uh, concerns that Afghanistan may lapse into another civil war, especially because uh, former regime's uh, vice president, uh, Amrullah Saleh, uh, is currently in the Panjshir Valley, and he has announced to resist uh, a possible Taliban government. Um, I would like to know... Uh, how likely is it for the international community, uh, the United States or Europe, to support uh, the armed resistance against Taliban in Afghanistan, especially after the full withdrawal? Oh, I think you explained the way the situation in Afghanistan quite well, but I just want to add a little bit that saying, uh, the, uh, despite there is a hope of the U.S. and many of the people in the West that uh, the Afghan government will be, the, which was propped up by the United States for 20 years, will be lasting for some period of time. Uh, it didn't. Uh, and it didn't mean it, it was not like a military victory of Taliban, but it's a tactical victory. It's a rather Taliban uh, got the control of the whole country, uh, not losing many life. There are very few places that are violence took place or war took place or any kind of, uh, you know, even gunfire took place. So it was a rather uh, quick, uh, regular transfer of power has taken place, which brings some hope that finally, after 40 plus years of war in the country, there is a certain kind of stability uh, where, well, I mean, you might call it peace, or I will call it absence of violent conflict will come. So there is certain, I, I mean, this is way it should be. There is certain kind of uh, peace building initiative might start. Of course, there are issues, uh, we, you know, we, we understand how Taliban has been before. Of course, given the fact that Taliban, uh, you know, uh, at least commits or rather uh, promises that it, it it is going to change or it has been, you know, it's moderating itself. Uh, and there are signs of that also. So it, it, that's why it brings hope in certain ways that probably some sort of uh, peace, quote unquote, will has arrived. Talking about Pansir, uh, this is a kind of uh, a very small area compared to the Northern Alliance conflict, which was there in the late 90s. Uh, this Ponsir Valley resistance uh, led by uh, Masood's son, who is young, uh, but also uh, the Saleh, uh, who, who used to be the vice president of Ghani. Uh, but I think, they, and there are some other troops, particularly the uh, special forces uh, uh, who were trained before by the uh, NATO. Uh, they have, some people have become there. But I think the real problem is that whether they have the support. Uh, even the, when they had support in the, uh, and support in Afghanistan. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Uh, if, if uh, particularly in the 90s or in the 2001, 
when they were much larger in size, they had much uh, larger support base com compared, you know, if you take the ethnic groups into account, they had uh, almost support for, from everyone and Taliban had only support from Pakistan. Still, they couldn't really defeat Taliban that time. And so now they are really confined to a very small pocket, which has no connections with the counter countries. Uh, many countries, those who were supporting Northern Alliance in the 90s, uh, Russia, Iran, are not going to support. They have been working together with Taliban. There is very likelihood even U.S. supporting uh, the Northern Alliance resistance because, uh, as you know, there have been areas that where U.S. and Taliban have started working together in many cases. Now that even at present they are working together and they have found a common enemy, which is the uh, ISISK group or Khorasan group, and I think that's where uh, that will bring them to work together. So I do see, I do see very little hope at this point of time. At least the Pansir Valley resistance making any kind of progress or getting into a certain kind. I, it's actually, but it's also at the same time we must realize that Taliban is also playing very well that uh, trying to make certain kind of uh, negotiated settlement rather than. And, uh, you know, because they had won everywhere, they could have just become this kind of taken all the forces and try to take it with the using violence. But they are you trying to um, take the help of even the international actors like Russia to mediate and to try to find a negotiated settlement. So I, I, as far as I see uh, at this point of time, I don't think Ponzi resistance doing very well for a long period of time. But hey, I can't. Uh, it all depends also how this uh, Taliban is going to perform, uh, delivering its promises to uh, Tali Afghan people as well as outside. So it all depends how this is going to map out in the near future, in the future. But at present, I don't see much hope of Taliban resistance. Thank you. Uh, another related question is uh, the role of India based on your own uh, knowledge and experience uh, with Indian politics. How likely is it for India to either support the Northern Alliance because they, uh, or, uh, they are, as you described, they are not the Northern Alliance anymore, but the Panjshir resistance. Uh, there are some times going back even to the 90s uh, with India. Uh, so is there any likelihood that they will receive any support from India uh, or not? And even more important, how likely is it for India to uh, build diplomatic relations with a future Taliban government? Yes, I think this is quite important question. If you see that because India, the whole situation in Afghanistan, though India doesn't have technically not anymore the direct uh, link, border link with Afghanistan, but India has been an actor or has also improved good relationship with the previous regime and also uh, the Najibullah and before as well. And India has been uh, the, it's, it's, it's been, uh, Afghanistan has been India's uh, somehow interest because keeping Pakistan into account, but of course there has been a huge cultural uh, and also economic significance of Afghanistan. Uh, at this point of time, uh, in there has been certain kind of uh, groups, those who really want to directly get involved. There are all sorts of things which is Indian media and others trying to project that there are quite a lot about this uh, uh, Ponzi resistance. But I think Indian government realizes that its, its options are quite limited at this point of time because the support, as I was mentioning about the international community, same is for India, how to reach, how to provide that support. There have been also certain groups those in, inside India, you may call it fringe, but nowadays you can't call anyone fringe, everyone is a mainstream. Um, so. Uh, they also demand that the Indian troops to be get involved. But I think that will never happen as far as I understand, uh, because uh, India has been involved in the troop movement once in the East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh. That has been a very successful one in that sense. Uh, but the, in Sri Lanka, 
which uh, it went to support the government, but you know, the, against the kind of gravel group which you were supporting, but that didn't really work out. It was a failure. India even lost a leader uh, because of uh, getting into there. So I think uh, India understands its limitations, at least hopefully at the official level, that not to get engaged uh, militarily, but there will be certain kind of uh, diploma, certain kind of support. Because you see, the, the Afghanistan uh, is, 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 is for India, it looks at it now in the Pakistan's uh, point of view, because the, uh, the any uh, regime which will be pro-Pakistan will not be looked or will will have issues with the Indian side, and the same thing. I mean, when the Afghan Afghanistan a regime support become friendly with India, then the Pakistan does everything to create problem for that regime. So it's a, it's a Afghanistan. I find it suffers because of India Pakistan's their own rivalry because they try to outdo each other there. But in this case, at this Pansir case, I do see very limited possibilities now for India to actively engage in or support that kind of support that group but of course there will be a moral uh, immo- support whatever is possible or diplomatic support but that will be limited to that at point okay uh, i uh, wonder uh, especially now under current circumstances uh, is it possible ever for india and pakistan to stop using Afghanistan as their battleground? Oh, God, that, that's, that is not, I don't see if this is going to happen soon. Or, I mean, I, we all hope so. We have been hoping it for 72 years that this would come to end. It is not. The kind of, it's, it's not only, you know, because uh, there are many ways uh, everyone plays there. It's uh, not, that's what I'm saying. It is not an interest of Afghan people is in mind. It's the national interest of each country is really prevail. Uh, and in that situation scenario, uh, th- I think you, 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 I, I always say that the, whenever whoever has asked me before that what is the main problem of the uh, Afghan government which was supported by the West, I said, look, you either take India with you or take Pakistan with you. You can't have two India and Pakistan as allies and get engaged in Afghanistan. That is not going to work because they, there will be a cross purposes working there. So this is this is unfortunate, the, the situation. And the U.S. actually was trying to keep India out of Afghanistan till 2010-11, you remember. After that, you know, India got in, 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 engaged or U.S. understood that. But then U.S. also looked at a larger picture vis-a-vis China. So then it brought in India to play its part. But I think it didn't work. And it, it this has been uh, has been working. Both Pakistan has been trying to undermine India's interest in Afghanistan and vice versa. So I think it doesn't really, uh, I don't see a good sense coming to any of them as sooner. Okay. Um while this is ongoing, uh, we also see that Afghanistan is currently going under an economic crisis. Banks are closed. Uh, the IMF has freezed uh, the assets, the uh, uh, Federal Reserve in, in the United States. Uh, the central bank in Afghanistan uh, does not operate. People have no cash. Uh, you know that Afghanistan is a landlocked country. Uh, we don't produce much food, uh, we can't even sustain ourselves. And yet, under these circumstances, we see that uh, there was an economy built based around occupation and NGOs. Now, that economy has collapsed. So, now the question is, will the international community sanction uh, a Taliban government because of who they are. I mean, they are the Taliban. Uh, the, what they stand for, what they have done. Will this result into uh, sanctions and isolation of Afghanistan? Or do you think that the international community will say, you know what, uh, we still have to remain involved and support Afghan people? Uh, 
uh, the, again, the who is the international community? That's uh, uh, if I we would, can't... In, in, in the first step, I would talk about Western countries yes, and then in the second part, the regional actors. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's why I was, I was asking rhetorically that uh, this is what the situation, you know, the... Um, but if we look at the West, I mean, let's let let me be very frank about this because uh, the U.S. Uh, spent almost 2.3 trillion dollar in in Afghanistan uh, or in the name of Afghanistan, uh, not in Afghanistan, but in the name of Afghanistan. So if 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 you if you take the cost of the all these in so-called international community, it. Yeah, and I, 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 if you give me a rough calculation of it, if they would have just given to this money to the Afghan people, every Afghan would have been uh, become a millionaire. What had happened when they went in the 2007 for the first calculation, the poverty rate ha has tripled, doubled in the last 20 years. Rather, in Afghanistan, people living under poverty has been uh, doubled. Uh, of course, some people made money. Some NGOs made money in Afghanistan, outside Afghanistan, uh, and some companies made money. Some military industrial complexes made money, and some politicians have made money, and some people, those who could influence this kind of deal making, made money. But the people, the I mean, the the uh, but these these two point, or the trillions of dollars has been spent for nothing, rather creating more poverty in the Afghanistan, ruining the economy. Uh, and uh, they made Afghanistan a very dependent economy where the almost 90% of its uh, budget was coming from outside. Uh, and that doesn't, that will not work at this point. Of course, it's a, it's a huge challenge for Afghanistan, for the people, how to survive, how to, uh, because the, all these kind of, uh, of course, there have been some infrastructures have been created, uh, but of course, we all know that, the, I mean, besides the corruption, there will be few uh, trickle-down effect will take place and some, some. Uh, but I think uh, how to run the day-to-day -day government, those government or the, the, uh, the institutions need uh, you know, proper taxation, proper way of uh, financing, but that hasn't been because it has become, as you, as we all know, has been a, a rentier state. Sorry, a yeah, rentier rent, state, rental, rental state, and that uh, that is now. And once uh, they are all coming out, trying to some countries even trying to provide the support to NGO, but they have stopped giving support to. This will be uh, to Taliban government. This will really create a bigger challenge for Taliban government. How to provide the basic uh, needs to the people, or basic provide the basic services to the people. But but I think this is again continuing to create challenge problems for the top Afghanistan people, Afghan people, because this is not going to really make any difficulties for Taliban. Taliban are not used to live in luxuries. They can really, they have, and they are quite good at making informal economy. So they have survived informal economy, through informal economy for decades. And, and then they will be, will be encouraging them also the poppy cultivation now is, I mean, of course, poppy cultivation tripled within, in, within the American um, presence in the U.S. And now we do have that. But I think saying that, because, and even if you go for the targeted sanctions on the Taliban, some leaders, that's not going to work that much because those Taliban leaders have nothing to do in the Western countries, so they will not be that much affected. So sanctions, if international community, which is very unlikely to impose sanctions on Afghanistan because there is no, you know, UN, UN Security Council is divided as ever before. Russia, China will not let it any kind of sanction at the U, U, Security Council level, UN level to impose on Taliban. That's for sure. So if there will be only Western's best sanctions, then this will be again creating the problem for Afghan people. But this is not going to harm the Taliban because Taliban uh, we have all seen in all countries, wherever these sanctions have come in by the Western powers, these groups or these leaders will use it very well to project themselves as the victim of the West or victim of the US, and that will rather enhance their support rather than decrease their support. So I think it will be actually a... a Counterproductive? creating the problem for Afghan people. It's not going to create any concern. It will rather strengthen Taliban's hand. Okay. Uh, 
Now, the another important matter uh, is that uh, I've read your interview today in a Dutch newspaper where you discussed uh, um, Hungary, Turkey, and India. Uh, you explained how uh, democratic regimes in these three countries are shifting away towards a more uh, religious nationalism and that this is a concern for, uh, for, for, for those countries but also for their uh, partners in the international community. Uh, we see in Afghanistan uh, 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 something that has gone to a much more radical uh, change where there was some sort of democracy before two weeks ago but now we have a, a religious uh, armed group which is in power. Uh, you know that that uh, even the European Union is sort of trying to distance itself from Viktor Orbán's regime in Hungary because what they stand for, for what they believe. And if we compare that to Taliban, this is it's on a whole different level. So, so do you think that that may be another reason for isolation of Afghanistan and more uh, economic, but also political, diplomatic problems? I think, yes, uh, the Europe somehow a little bit concerned sometimes about Hungary because it's, a, it's in their own backyard. But these countries do have co cooperate, collaborate with the very non-democratic countries all over the world. Uh, we have seen in the Middle East, we have seen in Africa, we have seen, uh, you know, or, or China. We have they they have worked together. Uh, so there is this has not really restrained the democracy or the religious nationalism uh, has never restrained them of working together. And I think that they have also their own challenges, you see. The religious nationalism uh, or uh, the populism which is going, growing all over the world. So how to deal with it? Of course, you, you can justify, give that as a justification when you are in the you know, public discourse, somehow you can uh, academically justify, look, we are uh, opposing urban, but Hey, Hungary is not uh, Afghanistan, neither Afghanistan is Hungary. You have to really look at it in that way. And then the question is, what else we can do in Afghanistan? You went there, you were there 20 years, used all the forces, killed 240,000 plus people. Uh, I mean, we are only talking about 2,000 2, to 6,000 American forces plus contractor, 2,000 plus 3,000 plus. But 240,000 or more of Afghans died in this conflict. Uh, and then we couldn't do much. The government we had put couldn't really stay for two more, two weeks. So why on earth you again impose sanctions on what? For what? So I think it's, it's it's what is the what is the what are the ambitions or objectives you have because when you are trying to take an action you must have an objective but if your objective is not really going to work that way we know very well sanctions is not going to uh, topple the regime in, in in or you can do much with the Taliban in Afghanistan you can only suffer the people who will be suffering again those Afghan people so I think this is this is this will be an academic reason but if you look at it there is that hasn't really stopped them uh, of uh, recognizing uh, even now urban they're working together with urban they work together with the Trump America Trump's America so that time so they and, and they have been working for decay ages with the Gulf countries and others so what is what is what is there to uh, I, I think this is a purely will be an academic exercise rather than anything else at this time but uh, you mentioned in the Gulf states we also have a very undemocratic regime in China uh, so international community cooperates with undemocratic uh, regimes, uh, authoritarian regimes. But those regimes are very powerful. They have uh, resources. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, you could say that they have reasons to cooperate with them. But what does Afghanistan have? True. 
I mean, that, that's, that's something you are right. I mean, of course, this kind of is not one trillion to three trillion mineral resources, which are always being talked about. Uh, but they were in 20 years. Some tried to, you know, there have been also investigation how the Afghan regime also together with some of the Western uh, contractors, they were trying to sell something. But uh, uh, but it's very, it's not really uh, easy to exploit the Afghan resources or what you call the monetized Afghanistan resources. Uh, uh, and so that's 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 a that's a possibility. That, that's what I'm saying. It's a more of a justifying what you are doing for other reasons rather than able to uh, achieving certain result through it. Or uh, you know, so that's that's the question that the Gulf um, Gulf countries have the oil or the China. They have to accept it because China is such a huge economic power. You can't really uh, do anything with China. You can't really force. I mean, that those are the. Uh, the, those are the real politics, which we need to, we, which we all understand. But I, I, my my thing is that it is uh, the, it doesn't you it is you, you you there is no such logic, strong logic, which can really justify uh, any sort of this side of uh, sanction based actions against the new regime in Afghanistan, which is Taliban. And. Uh... Other concerns are also uh, violation of human rights in Afghanistan, possibly under Taliban regime. Um, like, uh, let's suppose Taliban start uh, doing uh, things that will result in, uh, you know, violation of human rights, whether it's women's rights or minorities' rights. Um, and if that sort of thing happens, um, <clears throat> Do you think that Western countries will refuse to uh, open their uh, embassies uh, in Kabul and sort of have a very distant relationship with Afghanistan? Yes, that's a, that's a possibility because, of course, there will be a lot of internal pressure. People will be, uh, and I think uh, Taliban is trying to play that quite well till now, but it depends on, as I mentioned, there will be a possibility of uh, Taliban is also, you know, the, we have to look at it. Afghanistan, the whole region is very highly radicalized. So Taliban is walking a very tight rope uh, that how to do things which will be uh, also, uh, you know, acceptable to the West, acceptable to the rest of the in international community, which is trying hard to do get that. But at the same time, not losing the support which it had to the competing forces like you know the ISS. Uh, so so in this situation, it, if 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 uh, Taliban goes the other way, like you know Taliban goes back to its own style of what it used to, then there will be surely a international community, particularly West, will be under uh, pressure. But how much we, 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 we have seen because of what we have done, of course, there will be from their side. But we have seen in recent years, I mean, recent months, rather, Myanmar, where there was this uh, regime was taken, by the quote-unquote, again, a democratically elected regime was overthrown by the military forces. And we have seen what has been the, in Tigray by Ethiopian regime. Uh, of course, West has uh, expressed its annoyance, expressed its uh, uh, anger. In some cases, some limited uh, sanctions have taken place, stopping some things. But there is a very limited thing you can do because you see that in secu UN Security Council, all these this uh, Myanmar regime, the military junta, and uh, the Ethiopian Abe regime got the support from China and Russia, so nothing could be done. So, of course, but then you can take those kind of individual limited actions, but I think it all depends. That's why I'm saying it all depends how Taliban will be performing. I mean, if everybody will, Taliban will be looked at it very carefully by the, by the community. And if they, I mean, also the, uh, the pressure group, the civil society group will also keep a very close eye because they have been involved. There is a lot of emotions involved. So I think that will make a bit of challenge. But it all depends how Taliban is really acting to whatever it has promised. Yes, thank you. Um, aside from all the 
military and political groups involved in Afghanistan, regional actors, and then Western countries. Uh, another big concern is uh, the role of climate change in Afghanistan. Uh, we see in the last couple of years a lot of academics, but also in the media, uh, stressing that many armed conflicts are actually partially caused by climate change. Now, uh, from your uh, uh, perspective, uh, how do you see the role of climate change on the um, uh, security and stability situation of Afghanistan, uh, especially now? Very important question, because we have been all looking at Taliban or the US and the conflicts, because I think uh, we, uh, but the countries like Afghanistan is uh, highly, highly susceptible to the uh, issues like, or the threats like climate change. Climate change is threatening everywhere, in Netherlands to Sweden, everybody, uh, countries like this kind of rich, developed Western countries are feeling the pressure. And uh, Afghanistan has been going through all these wars for the last for more than four decades, is suffering from all sorts of crises, and climate change has come. Unfortunately, uh, not many developed Western countries was you know, they're engaged in this so-called uh, post uh, or the peace building process in Afghanistan after the 2001 uh, environment has never been a concern because it's uh, all these kind of, uh, you know, they put mostly money on military. I mean, this is the whole thing is uh, all uh, this uh, uh, facade of uh, creating and the country developing, but I think, and also the women rights, if you look at the military expenditure, 1,000 times more than women empowerment in the in, uh, in, in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. But um, rather than diverting our topic, uh, looking, looking at the climate change issue, in the climate change, Afghanistan has very little plan for how to address it. Afghanistan is going through serious drought in 2018. Drought was very, very severe. Half of Afghans, Afghanistan's population, almost 19 million population, are dependent now on the, you know, uh, uh, human security, uh, sorry, uh, emergency scenario. Uh, almost one third to half of the population are food insecure, that the starvation is going on or the hunger crisis is going on. Half of the country is uh, doesn't have water, drinking water. Two third of Afghanistan uh, doesn't have electricity, or power. I mean, in that context, how you talk about uh, creating a sustainable development in the country after recovering from the war and meeting the crisis which climate change poses. Climate change is uh, Afghanistan has uh, quite a num number of uh, good waters, uh, you know, Amundaria is there, Kabul River, there are lots of rivers, which is, and those are not, you no know, agreement is there, not much development has taken place on these rivers. Uh, Afghanistan hasn't really built uh, the, how to manage this water. Uh, 60%, uh, almost 80% Afghans live in the uh, rural areas, more than 60% dependent on agriculture. How how on uh, how do you think this will be working out? This is actually this is really going to be a very very serious problem. Climate change, co com, you know, co connecting with the conflict is creating and and also there have been we have seen in many cases uh, the glacial lake outburst flood is taking place quite a lot and that creates also for the problems. So drought, water scarcity, glacial lake outburst flood. Uh, lack of resources to build infrastructure to create this planning, and lack of any planning. There has been, you know, countries like in the West and many countries even in the South, like countries like Bangladesh, they have been planning how to do the address the climate change for decades now. But the Afghanistan has no plan how to address the climate change issues. So I think it will be a serious, serious crisis as I see it, uh, how the country will be, uh, whoever is the uh, ruling the country and particularly for Taliban. I don't know how much they understand actually the climate change as its impact. Uh, but of course, I hope there will be certain kind of proactive actions taken. But for that, you need certain kind of peace and stability in the country. 
without that you can't really think about the climate change if you are non you know insecure about yourself at present you can't really think about the future what is going to happen but considering all the kind of threats which climate change can bring and uh, combining with the the conflict and the violence and insecurity is still despite the swift victory of taliban i will put the afghanistan is one of the most fragile climate fragile countries in the world uh, now you have uh, uh, mentioned a very important matter water management in afghanistan while afghanistan has many rivers its water system is not managed uh, and at the same time we see uh, due to climate change dependency on uh, water is not just limited to afghanistan but also iran and pakistan uh, Let's suppose Afghanistan does manage to uh, create a system for uh, irrigation and uh, water management. Uh, this could mean that less water will flow into Iran and Pakistan. Could that be a reason for Iran and Pakistan to actually destabilize Afghanistan uh, further in order to prevent that uh, its water system is managed? This will be a great uh, diplomatic uh, challenge for the, whoever runs the country, and now particularly for Taliban, because Taliban has now Iran and uh, Pakistan at least supporting it. At the, I mean, Pakistan has been always supporting the Taliban or some... I mean, you know, there are... I, we all know that there are certain problems, but Pakistan has been the main supporter from Taliban for long term time than Iran has been. But this, you, you see, the India has been had, and also the the Amundaria, the most of Amundaria. I remember negotiating an agreement 2005, uh, even in the kind of uh, you know um, with all the uh, five central republic with Afghanistan um, in Kal Almaty. So there has been quite a large. Uh, part of uh, Amundaria is in Afghanistan. These are the areas, rivers, which have not been developed. So if uh, Afghanistan develops its uh, upstream water, uh, it will affect the Central Asian countries, uh, the Aral Sea Basin. It will affect Iran, Helmand province, and the other areas. And there, the, you know, Herat, the India had built a Salman Dam, which had reduced water supply to Iran. India had planned to build or support some dams, or there has been... Uh, the on the Kabul and Kunar River, I think that's called. And then they and this these are very important river, particularly Kabul pro, province and Kabul city is is dependent on this water. So you know, these these kind of uh, requirement water needs, particularly when there is a water supply and demand discrepancies are taking place, and if. Afghanistan will be coming out of from the war to start building its peace. Then, of course, the uh, Taliban need to develop the water and use more water, need to build more dams upstream, uh, small or big or medium, whatever. But that will certainly lead to uh, the uh, kind of water uh, moving to other countries, particularly in Pakistan, will be a bigger challenge. So my hunch is the uh, Taliban has many issues with Afghanistan to settle. But water will be one of the one of the main important issues to deal with, and how they really play that game, and that might affect their whole relationship there, because water is going to be extremely important for Afghanistan and for the Taliban regime, and that will real that makes it that that will make it very very sensitive for the Pakistan how to really accept it. Thank you. Uh, as a distinguished scholar, you have. Uh, had vast uh, experience in many issues, but what I'm personally interested in is knowing uh, your own uh, interest in Afghanistan. Like, ha have you been into Afghanistan? Uh, what was your personal involvement uh, as an academic, or, but also personally with Afghanistan in the last couple of decades? See, I have been, I have got many several times been invited to Afghanistan to even you know, but I I I've, I've never dared to go to Afghanistan. Being uh, I'm not a very uh, what do you call it uh, uh, 
adventurous person in that sense. So, but I have several students from Afghanistan. I have several friends from Afghanistan. Uh, so I have um, many several students have. I have written myself also papers on Afghanistan on the particularly on the drug uh, challenges. So, and there are several uh, my students those who have worked on the peace building. Uh, how the you know, development which has been taking place is not right way. The water scarcity recently, an Afghan student, uh, a couple of months back, she was writing on also the uh, the water issues. So I have been always engaged in Afghanistan issue as a peace and conflict researcher. And of course, there has been a lot of commonality of being growing up in India. Afghanistan has been part of our, the Indian uh, culture, Indian psych indian thinking so i think it's a, it's, a, it's a somehow there is a connection which is very strong in in, in, the, in indirectly rather than my direct presence in afghanistan itself okay uh going forward uh do you see any uh, opportunities to uh develop any kind of research or uh, uh, anything related to afghanistan Anything that we can look forward to your work uh, involved in Afghanistan? I uh, guess I think which is somehow it's Afghanistan particularly will be a way of, uh, because I think it is very important. We need to introspect Afghanistan, what has gone wrong and what can be done. These are the two things. And I think it's very important now the considering the, how the situation moves, but as I have discussed, particularly the climate change and water scarcity, because I'm, I'm, I'm also, I work, uh, I'm a UN UNESCO chair on international water cooperation. So I work on the water issues, water cooperation issues. So I'm more, much more interested to see how this is going to be worked out. And there I will be possibly moving into that uh, research in that. Okay, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you, more of your work. Uh, it has been a pleasure speaking to you. It's very enlightening. And uh, if our audience, if they want to uh, get to know more about you or get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to reach you? Send me an email or my Twitter. There is a Twitter account. Okay, there. I will add your email address and your Twitter in the description of this episode. Uh, Professor Swain, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time. To be, uh, I really appreciate that you uh, were ab available to answer our questions. And uh, hopefully we will see you again and uh, do another episode. Maybe uh, uh, evaluate some of the issues that we have discussed today. So thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay. And this was uh, episode 27 of the Afghan Eye podcast. Um, if you like to support uh, the Afghan Eye podcast, uh, please visit our Patreon page. Alternatively, you can support us via PayPal. And uh, make sure that you leave a review wherever you find or hear our content. Thank you very much. Wassalam.